one more talk, and that's an important one, uh, given by uh, John Bally, uh, the Milky Way as a star formation engine. Please. So before we storm the castle tonight, I thought we'd storm the Milky Way. So this is a talk um, that is going to summarize what we hope to present in Sergio Molinari's chapter called The Milky Way is a Star Formation Engine. And let me start with the backdrop. This is the central square degree of our Milky Way, the so-called central molecular zone with the black hole, whoops, with the black hole sitting there. Uh, you notice this giant bubble called the Galactic Center Bubble, centered on two of the most massive clusters in the galaxy. Uh, there's an object you'll hear about later from Steve Longmore called the Brick, one of the most extreme infrared dark clouds in the galaxy, and then one of the most extreme star forming complexes, Sagittarius B2. We'll come back to this uh, towards the end of the talk. So here's a quick outline. I want to tell you a little bit about what I mean by the galaxies of star formation engine. And a key idea in my mind is that to link the formation of stars and planetary systems to what's going on at high redshift, we have to understand the Milky Way as a complete ecology of star formation. Because after all, at the high redshift universe, a kiloparsec patch of sky is going to be the best we can resolve. We have to understand how to break that apart into, ad into basically stars and star clusters and units. It's like doing chemistry without doing atoms, uh, without knowing about atoms. That's why we have to understand the galaxy's entire ecology of star formation. So I'll say a few words about that. And then I'm going to concentrate on some of the recent surveys, specifically the Herschel Galactic Plane Survey known as HIGAL. And we'll talk about all the usual things, clouds, clumps, filaments. And uh, we'll go through a large number of images to show you what is there from an observer's point of view and what the theorists are going to be challenged to explain. By the way, this is the era of surveys. And uh, if you look back over the last 60 years, in this discipline, we started out by discovering molecular transitions in the millimeter part of the spectrum with heterodyne surveys, heterodyne observations. And up until about the 1990s, most of our surveys of the galaxy were done with heterodyne uh, instruments, CO surveys, uh, various other lines, H1 surveys. And then, since the 1990s, our incoherent detectors have gotten better. And in fact, we've been able to mosaic them into large focal planes. And all of a sudden, over the last decade, uh, we've now gotten spectacular continuum surveys uh, in the mid-infrared and far-infrared, Spitzer, uh, Herschel, etc. And so now there's a bit of a catch-up, I think. The heterodyne game has to be gone back to, as you'll see, because we need to get distances which require spectroscopy. The only way to do that is by high resolution, spectral surveys of most of the Milky Way with a resolution that matches what Herschel has given us already. By the way, I don't want you to read all this, but this just is to impress you what we've achieved in the last few decades. And I, I apologize for those of you who've flown other missions that I haven't listed. Uh, this is an incomplete list, but it should impress you that we've done an awful lot in terms of both space and ground-based missions. So here's what I mean by the galactic ecology. If you look around the solar vicinity, you come to realize that there's a grand cycle. If you follow the lifetime of an atom, a an atom will enter a molecular cloud at some point, a fraction of those atoms will end up in stars. And as we've heard from Mark, the star formation efficiency is something like a few percent to maybe 15 percent in the most active clouds on a GMC wide scale. So something happens, probably feedback blows the cloud apart, and part of that energy goes into creating bubbles, supernovae heated bubbles, H region heated bubbles, in fact super bubbles, which can reach dimensions of kiloparsecs. And eventually the gas falls back down, some of it recondenses into molecular clouds, and I would say that in the solar vicinity there's a cycle, and this cycle takes something like 50 to 100 mega years. It may be linked to spiral arms or may not be linked, it's somewhat unclear, but I'll tell you about a few numbers in a minute. Here's another view of it. Oops. Here's a galactic disk layer. If you have collective effect of multiple stars, OB stars, they will create coherent bubbles. We can see some of these around us, and I'll show you some pictures in a minute. Once the ma most massive stars die, for about 30 or 40 million years, you have supernova feedback. Those bubbles erupt, as sometimes blow completely clear of the galaxy, driving what we call the galactic fountain. Now, a couple of numbers to keep in mind. Near the sun, if you toss a cannonball out of the plane, it oscillates like a harmonic oscillator with a period of order 80 million years. So it kick up a cloud, it falls back 40 million years later, crosses the plane. On the other hand, if you kick a star, 
in the plane of the galaxy, it undergoes an epicyclic oscillation, which in the sun, near the sun, has been assumed or measured to be something like 170 million years. Compare that to the orbital period, time it takes to go around the galactic center, about 200 mega years. The point is that when gas goes up, it comes back down. And there's a coherent interaction between a sweep up of super bubbles and the time it uh, takes to for the material to fall back in. Why does this matter? So this is the recent Planck image that was released, I believe, about a year ago of the entire sky. Here's the galactic plane, galactic center. There is Cygnus, there is Orion. We'll come back down in a minute. Notice all this high latitude dust. This we know is fairly coherent. This is associated with the local super bubble. The Scorpius Centaurus OB association has blown a bubble that's about 200 parsecs or 300 parsecs in diameter. Here's the H1 data. This is ancient data from 1973. This is photographic material that to copy. And what you're seeing here is blue shifted H1 shell. This is 10 degrees between the tick marks. That shell is two steridians in diameter. In fact, the solar system's inside of this shell. If it goes through the data cube, you see that at near zero velocity, the shell fills up almost half the sky. By the way, that's the Orion super bubble. Its near side is coming towards us. It's 180 parsecs away. It's approaching us at 20 or 30 kilometers per second. It's 300 parsecs in diameter. So what this is telling us is that in the solar vicinity, OB stars and associations have had a profound effect on the interstellar medium. By the way, this is something I also find remarkable from the Planck collaboration using the continuum data of the Planck filters they've extracted a roughly five arc minute resolution all sky map of carbon monoxide. And it's, they, in the paper, they actually have J equals one to zero, two to one, and three to two. And so we actually know something about excitation. I want to point out this is the Rolf Eucas cloud, our Corona Australis cloud, Uriah A and B clouds. And this is a filament, as we've heard uh, this morning. This particular filament, I suspect, has a lot to do with its origins by being swept up and, and compressed by the Scorpius Centaurus OB association, as does this one. This guy and this guy are like comets pointing toward the center of energy release in Skosen. Let's keep going. This, by the way, is a similar view of the all sky H alpha map. By the way, Skosen is too old. It doesn't not have a H1 or H alpha signature. It has an H1 signature, but not H alpha. Here's Orion. There's a super bubble. That actually is about 40 degrees from end to end. And this side is 180 parsecs away. Let me zoom in on that. This is what we think is a face-on view of the solar vicinity. There's the sun. There's a Skosen bubble. There's the three subgroups that have been recognized since Blau's time. There's Orion. The Orion bubble, we think, is blowing back towards us. There's a Perseus molecular cloud, which is inside its, it, it itself is inside of a bubble driven by per OB2. And Blau pointed out many years ago that as a much older group centered on Alpha Percy, which appears to have driven an even older bubble, which we recognize as the expanding Lindblad ring. And in fact, I've often wondered why do cosmologists love to do cosmology, not straight overhead in galactic coordinates, but at longitude 145, latitude 50. Where the hell is that? It's not straight overhead. If there's the galactic center, this would be up that way. It's a strange location. It's directly above the Alpha Percy cluster. It appears that Alpha per Percy blew out a super bubble that cleared the galactic sky, if you like, so cosmologists can do their uh, favorite work in that direction. So sorry? Lockman Hole. Lockman Hole. Yes. Lock it, it, that's also the minimum column density of H1, that line of sight. Here's Orion. You can recognize Betelgeuse, Rigel, the Belt Stars, the Orion Nebula. The Orion Nebula and its 100,000 solar mass molecular cloud is embedded in the Orion OB Association super bubble, which is blown out of the galactic plane out, out to Eridanus. This wall is about 180 parsecs away. It's moving towards us from what we can tell from uh, stellar absorption. I'm going to show you what the molecular cloud looks like. This is ancient data uh, taken in the late 80s. Here's Orion, and in CO, color coded, redshift, blue shift, 10 kilometers per second end to end velocity. This is a modern view with Planck. You can see the dust emission at 545 gigahertz from Orion A, Orion B. And in the red, you see the free free plasma at 30 gigahertz, showing you that there's a very clear embeddedness of Orion there. Here's the CO map again. And I want to point out this integral shaped filament because if you zoom in there, here's the kinematics. This is from Ikeda and company. Notice the gradient. It's kind of a 
linear flat rotation curve almost, flat rotation with a jump right here. And if you look spatially, that coincides with the location of the Orion Nebula and the Orion Nebula cluster. Here's the density of stars from uh, John Carpenter's work. And if you look at this in comparison with models, this is a spectacular filament seen here with Doug Johnstone's um, 870, 800, 850 micron scuba map. And here's a recent model from Vasquez Semadini, where he, what he does, he looks at a colliding flow, forms a sheet, the sheet collapses to a filament, and the filament collapses end on. And here's the velocity field along this model filament. Notice how similar, look, this looks like a mirror image of this. Just flip it in, in the x-coordinate, and you see the similarity. And here's the kinematics. You get a velocity jump right in the middle, what is a convergent flow, exactly where uh, the Orion Nebula cluster is located. So let me jump into the galactic plane. That's just a little preview of what we see around the sun. So this is um, one of the early ground-based surveys, BOLOCAM survey, that Adam Ginsberg has been working on, and in fact, just published the second generation catalog uh, paper that's now in press. This shows you the central molecular zone and about 30 degrees of the galactic plane subdivided into to, um, 10 degree chunks. This is spatially filtered. You're only seeing the high spatial frequency component. Here's Atlas Gal. Again, the central molecular zone is slightly higher frequency, slightly better spatial res resolution, superposed on the Spitzer 24 microns. And so this is as well as we can do from the ground. And then we launch Herschel in 2009, and the sky lights up. We all of a sudden recover most of the zero spacing, low spatial frequency component. And so now there's a central molecular zone. Here's the Banyas clump 2. And here's parts of the galactic plane. I'm going to point out a few regions here. Famous object, Messier 17, below the plane. Messier 16, above the plane. Notice that Messier 16 is associated with a filament that goes right back down to the plane, and the orientation of filament is nearly orthogonal to the galactic plane. OK, this talk is going to be based into large measure on HIGAL, so this is the team. Well, the team, home institutions. If I were to list all the co eyes I'd fill the page and you wouldn't read anything because the script would be too small. That's what you get with 150 collaborators. Uh, this is an animation which I won't run because I think, um, let's see, maybe it will work. Nah, let's not bother with it. So let me introduce you to HIGAL. HIGAL initially was an open time key project which looked at the inner galaxy between plus and minus 60 degrees. In the second cycle, we put in uh, HIGAL 360 to do the outer galaxy. I'll show you the first results of that. And then in the second OT2, the third cycle, uh, we finished the galaxy. That's why it's called 2 pi HIGAL or HIGAL 2 pi. So we're doing the rest. So we will have, we have in our hands a full 360 degree survey, two degrees in latitude, so 700 square degrees of the entire Milky Way. And we are just beginning to mine this data. This is a legacy that's going to last decades. We have just started the analysis. It's, it's, believe me, doing surveys is not an easy task. It takes a lot of work. Let me show you a little bit of the outer galaxy. So here is the a chunk of the Perseus arm. Um, I guess that's about 20, 30 degrees, 40 degrees in extent. I'm going to zoom in to one of the major complexes. Bruce Elmagreen, decades ago, identified the fact that every few kiloparsecs along the major spiral arms has enormous concentrations of atomic hydrogen, maybe 10 to the 6th to up to 10 to the 7th solar masses, superclouds. And inside those superclouds, you have giant molecular cloud complexes. One of those is W345. Another 16 degrees up plane is the NGC 7538 complex, and you'll see both of those in a minute. Let me zoom into W345. That's right here. Here's a blow up. And see what's going on here. Well, that's W3. This bubble is W4, and this is W5. Here's how it registers the optical image. This is a visual wavelength image from the Palomar Sky Survey, registered approximately. So here we have W3. It's a compact H2 region with lots of active star formation. Uh, Doug, you worked on this cometary cloud, I believe. Uh, it shows up spectacularly, like a dagger pointing away from W4's heart. There's a group of O4 stars in here and a cluster that's created this huge bubble. And there's W5. 
in the middle of W5, there's a spectacular double cluster. This is not the famous H and Chi double cluster. It's an infrared double cluster that formed in the center of W5, which contains O stars and lots of Spitzer sources. This is a Spitzer uh, near infrared, 3.6 and 4.5 micron image. It's cavitated this whole region. And in fact, the star formation up in this region, as Adam Ginsberg showed some years ago, this is chock full of outflows and a number of infrared sources, but they are, appear not to be triggered because they're too far from the H to region edge. I'm going to jump up the plane to NGC 7538. This is one of the giant star forming complexes in Perseus. It's forming a, probably a bound cluster, it's got several dozen O stars. Its heating effects reach well over half a degree around the main H2 region, which is confined to here. This filament is orthogonal to the galactic plane. This is an equatorial, or galactic coordinates rather. So this is L equals, um, this is longitude in that direction. This filament we now know is chock full of hundreds of molecular hydrogen outflows. It's one of the most active sites of star formation that we've seen so far um, in the galaxy. I'm going to jump to the inner galaxy. Uh, now we're going to scale up our star formation to a scale where Orion is a total wimp. This is W43. In the middle here, there's a cluster which has a Lyman continuum luminosity, judged from the free free emission we see in a region, that's about 5 times 10 to 51 ionizing photons per second. That, compare that to 2 times 10 to 49 for Orion. That means there's 50 times as many O stars in this region as Orion. It's excavated a bubble. In fact, the bubble is seen here in dust. It's also seen in TeV gamma rays, which tells us there's been shock uh, some sort of shock excitation and particle acceleration. There's a chimney that we think may have been excavated and is blowing out of the galaxy. And again, there's a filamentary dust and molecular ridge here that Yancey has found has a coherent velocity field from uh, CSO observations. It's quite young, but yet there's WR stars in here. That tells us that the cluster is at least 3 million years old. There's a wolf ray star associated with that central cluster. Here's another image. There's where the WR plus O cluster is. There are some high luminosity, 10 to the 4 to 10 to the 5th L sun protoclusters around the periphery. The whole structure looks bipolar, perhaps because it's blowing out because of, of a disk-like configuration. And there's cometary clouds down here and here, which appear to point to an older subgroup of massive stars in this region down here. And this is the submillimeter emission combining Spitzer and Herschel 70 and 250 microns. And so bubbles, which then have peripheral star forming complexes at the edges, and cometary clouds with some very warm dust indicates that there must be O stars in this region, which are too obscure to be seen. Um, at all. By the way, Alyssa Good I stole this from Alyssa Goodman's, uh, one of her um, websites. She makes a very interesting point. That is, the sun is about 30 parsecs above the galactic plane. And this is a fairly profound effect for a vantage point. Uh, first of all, the IAU definition of galactic plane is wrong by about 6 parsecs and is wrong in orientation. And when we look at the nearby spiral arms, the Sagittarius arm and the Scutum arm, for example, uh, they're below the plane on average. So if they were perfectly confined and well-behaved, they'd be below the plane. Of course, because of random velocities in molecular clouds, uh, this is not so true. But many of the Perseus objects and some of the Scutum objects are noticeably below the plane. Uh, and I'll show you, I want to point that out as I go through these next set of images. This is W51. It's about 0.3 degrees below the plane. This is the Spitzer view, 3.6 to 8 microns. This is again like W43, about 100 times more powerful than Ryan. It's one of the giant H2 region complexes in the first quadrant. This is a longer wavelength view, including 24 microns. You now see heated dust throughout this entire region that measures some like 30 parsecs across. Where is the molecular gas? The several hundred thousand solar masses of gas in this region is in the filament that seems to be sandwiched between these hot H2 regions that surround it. And in fact, this core here, these two cores that you see saturated, represent two of the potentially cluster-forming cores in the first quadrant, which have enough mass to form 10 to the fourth solar mass clusters if they cho so to choose to do. I think their masses are close to 30,000 solar masses. So they could form arches or quintuplet-sized clusters if star formation feedback doesn't blow them apart. Let me go down back to M17 and M16. There's M17. There's M16 in close-up. There's this filament I pointed out. I want to zoom in a little bit. This is M17, and of course the H2 region nestles right in here. 
This is the edge where the ionization front is hitting the molecular cloud. There's lots of massive stars and low mass stars still embedded in there. This is M17 Southwest, which uh, Matt Povich has pointed out is probably the next likely region to become a very active site of star formation. Let me look at M16. You'll recognize the famous pillars, just like in the optical images. You can see them beautifully in the high gal image. And in the blue, you see the 70 micron heated dust that very neatly traces the interior of the H2 region. And the message here is that if you look at this image carefully, you realize that the heating effect of M16 reaches well out here. I also want to point out this object, the red square nebula. That is no protostar. That is a post-main sequence extreme red supergiant that's losing a disk. And in fact, we recently found that it has a nitrogen-rich excretion disk that appears to be lit up from M16. Uh, on the side facing M16. So some of these sources also show up as point sources in high gal, post-main sequence stars. I want to zoom in to uh, the fourth quadrant. Uh, Jim Jackson identified this very interesting object some years ago as an extreme infrared dark cloud called Nessie. And, and in fact, I think Alyssa wrote a, or was writing a paper, as I understand, called The Bones of the Galaxy, because she noted that, first of all, the position below the midplane is quite consistent with where we expect the midplane of the scutum arm to be. And in fact, there seems to be this extension that may trace parts of that filament over many, many degrees. When you zoom into that Nessie filament, uh, it's a little su more subtle here, but there it is. There's some H2 regions which may be associated with it. I think kinematics show that it is. And of course, lots of more distant background regions. This is another famous object, the Carina Nebula. Uh, Eta Carina, post-main sequence LBV. The Trumpla 14 cluster is creating an enormous bubble of hot dust, and you see all these beautiful pillars that Nathan Smith has written about uh, based on Spitzer data. Another famous cluster that you'll hear about later in this conference is 3603. NGC 3603 is one of the most massive clusters in the galaxy. It looks like a globular cluster. In the high gal data, it's created as hot bust dust bubble and has a heating influence that reaches all the way out to here. Let me zoom to the field next door, to the right. There's 3603 again. Right next door is NGC 3576. It's a well-known object because it's spectacular visually. There it is, registered approximately. Also a site of high mass star formation. Let me say a few words about uh, filament formation because that's been discussed at this meeting and probably will be. In fact, if we look at this data, as Philip Andre pointed out, we we seem to be seeing nothing but filaments. I think this is not unexpected, as Zeldovich pointed out in the cosmological context. If you take a roughly spherical cloud, that's uniform density more or less, but not quite perfectly spherical, it will tend to collapse on its minor axis to form a pancake. Zeldovich in cosmology context call this a Zeldovich pancake. A Zeldovich pancake, if you let it collapse, will tend to collapse into a three-dimensional filament, uh, basically a cigar-shaped object. So that's one way of making collapse, but that's very slow. Uh, as, as Enrique of Vasquez Amedini pointed out, Converging flows naturally lead to pancakes, sheets where the shocks collide, form a post-shock cooling layer. And as a sim simulation that he gave me, which will be shown in a minute here, those things also naturally in supersonic turbulence mo models will form sheets which then intersect to form filaments. So intersecting sheets can produce filaments. And finally, as I keep pointing out, Ophiuchus and Ar Arcon Australis and many of these cometary shapes the shadowing effect of cometary clouds also leaves behind filamentary tails. So we have no lack of filament forming mechanisms. So here's a model from Enrique. This is looking in the direction of the converging flow. So you're looking right into the flow convergence. So you're basically seeing the sheet um, filling the plane. He has sink particles in here. And then a sheet actually collapses to form this filamentary structure. In fact, that model I compared to the Orion integral shaped filament came from this uh, very simulation. And so colliding flows naturally can reproduce the kinds of structures we see in regions uh, such as Orion. By the way, when we look at the radial density profiles of these filaments, this I, I stole from this paper on the IC5146, shows the uh, column density as a function of radius. And here is Enrique's column density as a function of radius, very similar in size and shape to what the observations show in IC5146. A point here is that in the model, when you look at the column density and look at the collapse rate along the filament, in, along, in, in unit length along the filament, in solar masses per year per um, parsec, 
there's no step function. There's no threshold. And in fact, as Sergio pointed out in one, a paper that's about to be submitted uh, by Shizano et al., um, when you look at the filaments extracted from Herschel, you see the filament linear mass in solar masses per linear parsec. Uh, as a function of the mass, you don't see a threshold effect. The blue ones are, as far as we can tell, not star forming. The red ones are star forming. Is that correct, Sergio? Or to get that backwards? Never remember the, the definition of symbols. The key point is that there's no um, thresholds, as far as we can tell. Uh, you increase the filament column density, the collapse rate, and in fact, the luminosity of these filaments appears to increase, hence their star formation activity. This actually shows that in the same way. Uh, this is the mass of the filament increasing to the right, and in three types of filaments, ones without any evidence of star formation or clumps, ones uh, with prestellar cores but no stars, and in red, ones with stars because they have embedded point sources and heating. And here's the same plot color-coded according to their luminosity, ones which are luminous in red and ones which uh, do not have point sources in black. By the way, a critical point is distance determination. The problem with these continuum surveys is you can't tell whether the cloud is in front of your nose or on the far side of the galaxy until you have a radial velocity and some way of interpreting that in terms of a distance. So there's three approaches to this. Uh, Roussel et al. have used what I call the bootstrap approach where they associate clumps with nearby objects with a known distance using morphological matching in both spatial, spatial, and velocity space. So if they have the same radio velocity, appear to be connected, we associate nearby clumps with objects uh, at that known distance. Another approach is, of course, the best one, the Bessel project by Mark Reed, uh, who's measuring 400 parallaxes uh, over the next few years using masers, water masers, methanol masers. And you've seen a number of those papers. Here's an example of one. It has dozens of papers by those groups. And finally, there's this distance, prob distance probability density function, not to be confused with density probability distribution functions. That's by Tim Ellsworth Bowers uh, in our group. And here, here's what he does. He actually uses a prior, namely the 8 micron dust distribution in the galaxy. How bright is the galaxy as a function of position and line of sight um, distance? And so he asks, what is the contrast at 8 microns between an infrared dark cloud and the surroundings? And so he evaluates automatically, by the way, he ingests the radial velocity, a galactic rotation model, and a, this map of the galaxy, and then decides whether he can resolve the kinematic distance ambiguity. And so here's three examples. Here's a case where the distance is very well resolved. So you have a firm distance. Here it's near the tangent point. We're not sure if it's near or far. And here it's not near the tangent point. And so there's two possible distances, and the method fails to resolve the kinematic distance ambiguity. We have to go to some other approach. Here's how this, this is, we've now done something like uh, 600 clumps, selected in this case from the Bolocan Galactic Plane Survey. Yancey Shirley and his team have taken thousands of spectra with the Mont Graham telescope to get radio velocities toward these clumps. Uh, here's a subset of them. And then by analyzing the rotation curve and figuring out whether they're near or far distance, at, um, we can decide whether they're near or far. And here's what the galaxy looks like for these uh, 600 or so clumps. Most are in the near uh, side distance, some are in the far side. And since we are located above the midplane, here's the distribution in galactic uh, latitude as a function of distance. Here's how uh, Tim Ellsworth uh, Bowers' method works. Here's a Bolocam contour map with Eric Rozolowski's uh, contours setting the boundary. We analyze what's inside that boundary in the uh, 8 micron glimpse images. We filter out stars, fit the background, we generate a synthetic map and estimate the column density, and then we basically use the model galaxy to figure out whether the foreground 8 micron brightness is consistent with near or far distance, and hence we attempt to resolve the distance ambiguity. In this case, the model gives us an extremely reliable distance at the near side value of the kinematic distance ambiguity. I mentioned Mark Reed's program. This is uh, where he is today. I think there's, I, uh, I'm not quite sure how many points are here, but of order, a little bit less than 100. Within a few years, by 2015, he should have 400 points. We are literally surveying, he is literally surveying the galaxy and getting a series of markers with a reliable, direct parallax distance to certain regions, which then we can bootstrap from to reconstruct what the face-on view of the galaxy should look like. And here's the plan. Here we are, at the beginning of 2013. 
Bessel is going to do this number of sources uh, by 2013, another few hundred by 2015. Let's see, I may skip this. Uh, what have you learned? Uh, this is from Kara Battersby's work. Kara Battersby's work. It shows that when you look at infrared dark clouds and look at their properties, some have some levels of star formation measured by masers, but no H2 regions. Others have, others have compact H2 regions. Others have full-blown H2 regions. How do the dust properties vary? And what Kara has shown is that as the signposts of star formation increase from no star formation to very bright 24 micron emission to H2 regions, um, the temperature that you measure increases. And so these three color zones show you the different regimes um, where you have uh, what the dust temperature is as a function of whether or not there's extreme green, uh, green, extreme green objects at, in the Spitzer data, methanol masers, 8 micron bright sources, or 24 micron bright sources. This is the face-on view of a section of the galaxy extracted by a paper that was uh, just about to be submitted by Pestazzoli, looking at the uh, L equals 344 to 307 region. Uh, they've extracted something like between 11,000 at 70 microns to 300,000 at 250 micron point sources in this data. They analyze their properties, the luminosities as a function of the mass of the associated clump. Here's the cold ones, here's the ones at star formation. And here's the, their distribution in the galaxy um, when, we try, when we resolve distance ambiguity. I'm going to finish off by going to the central molecular zone. This is now a wide field view showing you about 8 square degrees. Galactic center is right there. The galactic center bubble, SAG B2, SAG C. The L equals 1.5 complex, the object that's been dubbed Banyas clump 2, L equals 3. And this is the greatest concentration of dense gas in the galaxy. Something like 80% of all the gas at a density above 10 to the fourth is in this central molecular zone. Most of it is quite inert. There's very little star formation here or here. Almost all the star formation is out here between L equals 0.8 and minus 0.8. Zoom into Banyas clump 2, just a clumpy structure, very little star formation. Its kinematics is really strange. This is a CO map. Here's the galactic plane. You can see the narrow lines associated with foreground spiral arms. Line widths are typically a few clumps per second. These are the central molecular zone clouds. Notice the SAG B2 line width is almost 50 or more kilometers per second. But Banyas clump 2, within a span of less than a half degree of sky, covers 200 kilometers per second. That's crazy. What's uh, going on there? There it is in the spatial map. Well, one idea is that you're looking along this filament, basically at the leading edge of a bar. And you're just, because the orientation of the bar these clouds are lined up. Uh, and so you're seeing components which are moving very slowly in radial velocity and moving very fast at radial velocity. So you're seeing a large velocity spread. Another idea is it's the end of the innermost X1 orbit where gas comes in, slows down, turns around, and starts falling back. And maybe it's a, com a combination of the two. Another idea is you're actually seeing a cloud-cloud collision between fast stuff coming in raining onto these so-called X2 orbits, which, which contain all the dense gas. By the way, this galaxy, I've always looked for analogies, nearby galaxies. And here's one. This is more extremely barred. NGC 1097. There's a central molecular zone that it has. There's the innermost X1 orbit here and here. If you zoom in, the central molecular zone of this galaxy is an enormous starburst. It's about 10 or 15 solar masses per year of star formation going on in there. So this may be an analogous system to our galaxy, but more virulent uh, than what we see in the central molecular zone. Also, our galaxy is asymmetric. It's not a neat ring like this. Uh, Two-thirds of the gas and dust is at positive longitudes. There's very little at negative longitudes. But what you notice in this image at 24 microns is notice that there's a huge number of 24 micron sources at negative longitudes, whereas all the dust is at positive. Now, if these are forming massive stars, I have to ask, how come the forming massive stars aren't where the molecular gas is? So maybe they're not forming massive stars. Maybe they're post-main sequence stars that are shedding dust, or they're red supergiants that are being lit up by the harsh radiation field of the nuclear environment. Some of these things certainly are post-main sequence. That ring is real. That's a luminous blue variable dust shell that we see at 24 microns. And a number of other sources here have been classified as post-main sequence. The fact that they're all crowded here suggests there's a collection of massive stars that are dying. 
suggests that it was a starburst in the past that may have blown out that part of the central molecular zone through hundreds of supernovae. Maybe that's why it is in symmetry. But I want to show you how this compares to the radio. This is 20 centimeter in blue, and I'm going to change the contrast here. There you can see the non-thermal supernova that's uh, down just below the galactic plane, the mouse as we dubbed it years ago. The use of Zada non-thermal filaments cross right here, just at the up-plane edge of the galactic center bubble. There's Sag A star. So Fue and Honda, 30 years ago, identified H1 gas and ionized gas right here, just at the, at, above and below the regions where you have intense star formation and two micron bright light. And this, if you change the contrast a bit, you can see. This is inert dust. Sag B2 is right there. The brick, as Steve will tell you, tomorrow is right there. Arches and quintuplet are right here. Sag A stars right here. Um, and all these 24 micron sources cluster uh, in that region. By the way, one of the results from Herschel that Sergio Molinari published some years ago is the so-called 100 parsec ring. Almost all the star formation, the most virulent star formation, appears to be in this ring. And if you look at the column density maps, it traces out this what looks like an infinity sign. It simply says that the potential has flattened by 2 to 1, so that the vertical oscillation time scale is twice the orbital time scale. So as a particle goes around, and it doesn't orbit like Kepler. Probably, if, you know, these are eccentric orbits. Here's the nucleus. At apocenter, it's slow, and then plunges in past Sag A star, slows down, and that, you know, accelerates, slows down, accelerates, slows down. That's how you should think about it. As the clouds do that, they also oscillate about the potential, if they have any vertical component. And all the, the figure eight says is that the potential is two to one flattening uh, ratio. Oops. So this is the model that Sergio put together. This is above the plane, this is below the plane. Here's a face on view. We think that because the 20 and 50 kilometers per second clouds are so close to Sag A star, this ring is not centered on the nucleus. It's asymmetric. Sag B2 may be at the apex, but I'm somewhat suspicious of this because it has proper motions of 80 kilometers per second up plane. So it's not the tangent point of this arc. This is a map, and we're almost done here. Um, Kara Battersby computed by extracting, separating the cold clumps from the diffuse cirrus background. So the background is the temperature of the smooth component of the emission. This is the column density of that component. And then in this jagged area, you see the colder clumps. And so you see, for example, the brick and the filaments leading to Sag B2 are much colder in the background. The helical is 1.5 complex and binary is clump 2, very cold. Sag C is very bright. And this is where all the warm dust is. This is where all the cold dust is. This is the column density. This is where the bulk of the mass is. Sag B2 is the most column, you know, 2,000 magnitudes of extinction. And the helical is 1.5 has a huge reservoir of several times 10 to the 7 solar masses that isn't forming stars. What's going on there? Well, that's to be seen. Let me just zoom in. I'll finish in a minute here. Close up with the brick, Sag B2, Sag A. This is just eight microns. This is combination 87350. You see the galactic center bubble. This is my lead out view graph. There's Sag B2 is being to show up. There's the 20 kilometer per second cloud, the 50 kilometer per second cloud, the circumnuclear disk, that seven parsec radius structure, 100,000 solar masses of HCN bearing gas right around the central black hole. This is the free-free emission at 20, uh, well, free-free and non-thermal at 20 centimeter. There's the black hole in Sag A East, the arched filaments, the non-thermal filaments, the brick may be seen in silhouette here, maybe, not clear. Here's a circumnuclear ring. The black hole's right there. This is a zoom in. There's the HCN ring from uh, Nick Scovel's work. The free-free emission from that ring, the black hole, the central cluster. Quite extraordinary how those stars formed. Arches and pistol located here. By the way, this view graph, I think, points out something in my mind. And that is, it's not clear to me that the, mass, the supermassive black holes any influence on our galaxy's gal galactic star formation. In fact, I'd rather think the evidence is pointing in the direction that, in fact, star formation starves the black hole, prevents it from growing. In fact, star formation, I think, is responsible for this feature, the so-called galactic center bubble, or um, Sophoy Honda lobe, and on much larger scales, the Fermi lat bubble that's been identified by gamma rays and now polarized radio continuum emission. 
So I'm going to stop at that point. Uh, just one plug for the future. This is the era of Alma. We're going to get exquisite subarc second resolution images of substructures in these clouds. But we still need single dish surveys with the resolution that's comparable to Herschel and Spitzer. So this is, in fact, the best Herschel 250 micron map of a chunk of sky. CCAT at 350 microns, CCAT's going to be a 25 meter telescope, should produce much better maps. We need velocity resolved data uh, with that kind of resolution. And I'm going to stop there, just put up my conclusions so we can all go storm the castle. <laughs> Thanks very much, John. Uh, are there questions for John? Mordecai. <laughs> ah, I cannot see him. So, this is, hello? Hello? There. OK, Mordecai Macklow, AMNH. Um, so this was your last point about the star formation limiting the black hole is something that we've already seen in models of massive star formation by uh, Peters et al., where yeah. we saw fragmentation-induced starvation. The accretion flow that you need to make a massive star or a black hole is so dense that it itself is gravitationally unstable and starts forming yeah. low-mass objects around it. Yeah, that's a good point. And I think Phil Armitage, who's someplace in the audience here, has pointed out that in some sense, the, a disk around the central mass black hole is like a planetary disk around a star. So except the, if you just scale things in that way, the, the mass of the secondary objects that form in a disk are stellar mass, because the black hole is a mass of four million solar masses. So there's an interesting potential analogy in nature there. So. Are there any question, other questions? Uh, actually, uh, I had one myself. <laughs> uh, that's about the uh, threshold issue uh, mm -hmm. that you mentioned. Yes. You mentioned that there was no threshold uh, in the IGAL uh, data with the, uh, the light mass of the filaments. Mm -hmm. And taken at face value, there is a, uh, well, a, a difference with what we find in nearby clouds. So I was uh, wondering uh, whether you had uh, views how to reconcile these two So that's uh, a very good question. Uh, a first thing to, to notice is that the clouds that we extract from high gal, the filaments we extract from high gal, are at a much larger scale than your nearby objects. Yeah. So we're looking at things which are kiloparsecs away. And so we're looking at mass scales, which are one to two orders of magnitude larger than with the nearby filaments. So that's a possible answer. Maybe, Sergio, you have a comment on, on, on that? Because you had a difference between yes. star-forming clumps and non-star-forming clumps, right. right? No, no, no. This, uh, uh, the, 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 the coding was, was confusing because it was two view graphs with the same coding but different meaning. Um, the coding uh, in, that, in that view graph had nothing to do with the uh, forming stars or non-forming stars. It's just if you include the clump in the filament linear mass or not. Oh, yeah. But it tells yeah. you the same story. We are looking probably at different physics, different types of uh, masses and linear scales. OK. There is another question here from Hans. <laughs> oh. OK. This isn't actually, oh, OK. Uh, uh, hi, uh, Sergei in the action uh, here. Um, this uh, Fermi bubble fe feature that uh, you uh, discussed, uh, I think it's a you know, really interesting uh, feature. But I, I see a lot of people uh, contrib attributing it to star formation just because we see star formation feedback much more easily, in my opinion, than AGN feedback. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, uh, in our galaxy, there is only one um, elephant called CJ star. Mm -hmm. And that elephant uh, had uh, a cloud of about a uh, few times 10 to the 4 solar masses uh, in the central 0.5 parsec 6 million years ago. We know that because that's how much gas you need to form uh, the, the, the central uh, star cluster that um, yes. you know, Ryan Genzo yeah. and Andrea Gass observed. Um, and you know, some people in the audience um, uh, and myself modeled this, this process. So you know it's, it's very well. And uh, there is more than enough energy available in, in, in that um, outburst from Sergei Star. So I, I think that 
you know, yeah. it's probably was. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and I think the, the, the question we should ask is how, how do we distinguish AGN fed models versus star formation fed models? And I think the key observations are mass loading how much mass is actually launched well above the plane. And so in an AGN-fed model, I presume it's mostly very light uh, relativistic fluid that's f inflating the bubble. Whereas in a starburst model, you expect it's H1, it's the debris, the remnants of the central molecular zone that's being blown out, that's mass loading it. And I, th I think there's actually a number of tests which are being done by looking at back absorption lines in the ultraviolet toward background quasars, which will actually, I think, in the next few years settle this issue. The question is how much mass is there and can we account for it by black hole feedback or do we need to add the mass loading associated with uh, supernova driven outflows? That's an interesting, uh, that's an interesting um, um, point, but <laughs> we should remember that uh, the cosmologists tell us that the galaxies, you know, the, the largest galaxies are actually cleared by AGN feedback. So we know that right. uh, AGN feedback can blow, blow up whole galaxies. You know, and that right. mass, mass loading there is rather extreme. So I actually don't quite agree with your point. I think sure. you can actually blow out a lot of mass with this. Yeah, so I agree this is a controversial point. One last uh, <laughs> short question from Hans. Well, uh, as one of the dinosaurs of the protostars in planet series, I, I have a question which goes back in time to 1977 when Bruce Elmagreen and Lada uh, invented the sequential star formation. Yeah and more, um, to the point, triggered star form. Mm -hmm. So with all these that you, we have now, decades later, are we more informed about uh, whether triggered star formation or sequential star I formation I knew this works? would come up. <laughs> <laughs> ah, the boogaboo of triggering. I, you know, I, let me put, here's the problem with triggering. I, I think it's a fine model. But observationally, I think it's extremely difficult to tell. And there's three possibilities. One is I can have a pre-existing clump that sits there, would have formed a star anyway. Nearby, an H2 region forms. What happens? The ionization front runs right up to the dense gas and stalls. And when I look at that thing, it looks just like the models that triggered star formation. The other case is that there's a cloud which wouldn't have formed a star. And then the, the pressure wave comes in and is... We've heard from um, many modelers, the ray of driven explosion, you know, RDI, radiation driven explosion, implosion rather, not explosion. You crush the cloud by pressure, you trigger star formation that way. What's the sign? And the third possibility is collect and collapse. You sweep up a shell, it fragments. How do you distinguish? I think precision, proper motions are absolutely vital. If star formation is not triggered at all, you expect no correlation between the second generation or third generation stars and the initial cluster. If it is RDI or pressure driven collapse, you will get some acceleration, it will be very mild, so that you may have a slight expansion, but in the collect and collapse picture, you clearly expect a real expansion of the second generation stars away. I think to distinguish those models, really, you can't just look at morphology. I think you need precision kinematics. And I think we may have that in a few years with Gaia. Although the problem is, of course, you can only see the visual stars, not the infrared and embedded stars. So even Gaia may not settle the issue. But I think I, I'm really a skeptic when it comes to triggering. I, I believe it works. I believe it happens. I think to prove it happens is extremely difficult. I think that includes supernovae, because if, if, from the modelers, uh, you know, I, I've seen models which shatter the clouds rather than compress. You know, you just basically the f hypersonic shock waves produce filigree, which don't ever cool enough or compress enough to make um, stars. And so it's not clear to me it's a positive feedback or a negative feedback. Okay. okay. Thanks very much. Uh